So, all right, let's look at uh, let's look at cancer. Uh, we are going to focus mainly on what it is, what are the types, what are the risk factors, the treatment modalities, uh, and how do we classify cancer. Those are the things that we are basically uh, that we are to look at in this presentation. So we talk about cancers when we refer to a situation where we have uh, a condition in which we are having cells uh, growing at a very rapid rate uh, in a manner that is not controlled. So we have abnormal cell growth and division. In our earlier presentation, we saw that uh, we saw what we call the cell cycle, where we say there is that preparatory phase, the interphase, and then the mitotic phase where the cell now divides. Um, so this process is usually regulated. And we looked at the different regulatory mechanisms, we looked at the checkpoints, and then we looked at the, the, the positive and negative regulators of the cell cycle. Now, when we don't have these mechanisms in place, that means that we are going to have cells that are going to divide abnormally and grow abnormally. Okay, so this this growth therefore means that the the the, the, the processes that perhaps could result into controlling the number of cells that is apoptosis doesn't work as it should be okay the cells as if they are damaged they if they have any abnormalities um, chemical reactions or are, are, are initiated such that they can actually die uh, such that they don't continue multiplying abnormally and uh, that is where apoptosis becomes very important but where you have a disruption uh, in the cell uh, processes of uh, apoptosis, then you're most likely going to have unrestrained growth of cells. And that is basically cancer. So we have different types of cancers, and the way they manifest differs uh, um, uh, in terms of. Uh, of what the, the, the cancer will, man, will probably man, uh, manifest depending on um, where it is coming from, uh, whether it is uh, uh, benign or metastatic, so that is, it is very aggressive, growing very fast, going to other parts, um, or it is remaining in one place that is benign. And these these two things and the other factors actually play an important role in whether these cancers will respond to treatment and therefore um, you have a better outcome or you have a poor prognosis. So um, the prognosis of cancers differs because uh, these cancers don't have the same characteristics in terms of being uh, metastatic, in terms of being aggressive, in terms of which organ they are actually affecting, where are they located, um, which physiological processes are doing, are they going to disrupt, uh, things like that. So those things determine the prognosis of, of cancers. So cancers, I mean uh, tumors, benign okay or malignant when we say that they are they are benign we are basically saying that is the, for them they don't uh, invade or move to the neighboring tissues and affect them like those are benign tumors okay so now before we look at that perhaps we need to get to know what tumors are tumors are basically uh, abnormal growth tissues okay 
so this these tumors can be cancerous okay they can be cancerous and, and therefore we call them benign if they remain localized and don't invade the neighboring tissues but the moment they become they, they, the, the moment uh, we have tumors that can move to other places let me say that uh, they are malignant tumors okay that means that the they, the cancerous cells can be uh, can attack other distant organs uh, either through blood uh, bloodstream or through the lymphatic system where they can basically seed through uh, to different organs so metastasis is that uh, invasion of other body parts by cancerous cells so tumors uh, malignant tumors usually have very bad prognosis so they need actually to be uh, treated uh, such that they cannot be life threatening okay so uh, lung cancer breast cancer colon cancer these are examples of malignant tumors so these neoplastic cells or cancer cells um, they have characteristics that are not uh, that are not deformed in normal cells okay remember the first thing is in normal cells you have the cells dividing uh, normally that is that the, the cell division is actually controlled okay using the mechanisms that I listed earlier on. So with the cancer cells, you don't have uh, these controls in place. So you have growth that is unrestrained and the division is also uncontrolled. And then malignant cells also um, are unresponsive to feedback mechanisms regulating cellular proliferation. Okay, we have what you call tumor suppressing genes okay these basically um, uh, um, is one of the mechanisms that cells can have in order to regulate that division that uncontrolled proliferation okay so malignant cells do not respond to these mechanisms that try to inhibit cellular proliferation and then we also said that malignant cells can basically move uh, from the primary tumor to adjacent organs okay and therefore spreading the cancer to other organs of the body okay and we said that um, it can be through the bloodstream it can be through the lymphatic system so the secondary tumors these are the ones now uh, that are arising from the, the, sp the spread the cancerous cells. So you can have the cancer of the, uh, of the ovary, for example, and then ending up causing uh, uh, metastatic uh, tumors for the lung, or on the lungs. So the, the ones on the lungs are the ones we are calling them secondary tumors and sometimes you can have these tumors but uh, relocating where the primary tumor is can actually be very hard okay so it is possible to have secondary tumors but locating the primary tumors can be hard so what are the causes of cancer cancer it is not caused by one factor you have an interplay of several so we say cancer uh, has multifactorial causes okay so we are going to look at these factors that lead to cancer the so-called risk factors for cancer so we have what we have age okay age is a major risk factor for for cancer okay the the, the, the number of people who have the the, the more years one hand the more likely that they can get cancer so that means that the incidence of cancer increases with with age okay as the cells age uh, 
they, they are exposed to agents that can cause genetic mutations. And this will damage the, the genes of the chromosomes. And this uh, will likely distort the mechanisms that are in place to control cellular proliferation. Okay? So exposure to uh, these mutations can damage the cells and result in into cancer. So as you grow, uh, these carcinogenic uh, elements actually accumulate, okay, and then obviously causing um, uh, cancer, okay. Also, as people grow up, uh, their immune system actually is weakened, making it difficult to detect cancerous cells, okay. Remember, we earlier on said that the the the, the, the cells are, are, are controlled. Okay, the cell proliferation is controlled, or cell division is actually controlled. Okay, and uh, if uh, if a cell is not ready to divide, okay, to produce daughter cells, because it has a damage, it the that process of cell division is halted. Okay, and therefore uh, the halting. And the destruction of that cell that is damaged, and that is the role of the immune, uh, the immune system. Now, in older people, the immune system is weakened and therefore it has less ability to be able to detect uh, cancerous cells and then be able to destroy them. Okay, so that is why uh, certain uh, cancers are common. In the elderly and then we have genetics okay we have certain cancers uh, we have cancers like, such as breast cancer and having a strong component of genetic predisposition okay genes such as the uh, brca1 and the uh, brca2 these actually increase the chances of getting breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and other types of cancers. Actually, this uh, checking for this gene can be one of the ways to screen uh, for individuals who are at a higher risk of getting breast cancer. Okay, so uh, genetic predisposition plays an important role in uh, certain cancers, such as the breast cancer and the, the ovarian cancer. Okay, so if you have a relative uh, who had breast cancer, uh, it's most likely that uh, you also carry that risk. So it could be very important uh, to, to actually go for screening uh, or even do self-examination, uh, breast self-examination uh, before it is actually too late. Okay, so that, that is the purpose of basically screening, uh, it helps it to detect uh, the, uh, the tumor uh, before it actually becomes very problematic and having a poor prognosis. So the other risk factors uh, associated with our lifestyles, individuals who smoke has, have higher risks of getting uh, throat, lung and mouth and bladder cancers. Okay, uh, so uh, smoking uh, increases the risk for cancers because smoking or, or uh, smoking, in, in smoking you are exposed to a number of carcinogens and tobacco has thousands of, uh, of these uh, carcinogenic uh, substances. And then our diet, diet that, is, that consists of highly processed foods, red meat, sugary beverages, and low intake of fruit, or fruit, fruits, vegetables, and fiber will increase the risk for, for cancer. So it means that you need to eat vegetables, fiber, such that you can uh, and reduce the intake of processed foods and red meat, and also sugary beverages. 
such that you can reduce the risk of cancer. And then people who don't really exercise, uh, ec um, lack of exercise is linked to with uh, is linked to obesity, increased uh, and also increased risk of uh, various cancers, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, and breast cancer. And then we have environmental exposure such as radiations. Ionizing radiations can come from even uh, medical procedures that that we are done within the hospital. X-rays, uh, CT scans, uh, also nuclear leakages or radon gas, all these um, are radiations that can damage the DNA and therefore uh, result into cancer. And then we have chemicals, okay? Uh, we have chemicals such as asbestos, benzene, and then formaldehyde. These also increase the risk of lung, bladder, and other cancers. And then environmental pollution, uh, pollution uh, coming from factories, coming from cars, all these, or even oil refineries can predispose one uh, to cancers. So, Let's go back to that genetic predisposition to certain ca uh, cancers. We need to really get to know what, what are the things that happen. Um, in our bodies, we have uh, cells that, uh, we, we, have, we have, of course, uh, body cells, and these body cells keep multiplying okay, through the process of mitosis. Now, they, 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 we said already that the process of this uh, mitotic diffusion is actually controlled. Okay? And the, we have genes that control this cellular division. So, genes that suppress uh, cellular proliferation. Okay? Um, now, the oncogenes are genes that when they have been mutated, when mutated or when activated, they promote cellular division and they grow. So that means that oncogenes, when they become active, they promote cellular growth. And therefore, if you have mutations, mutations which are basically the, the, the changes in the genetic material, the genes and the chromosome, often mutations come from the, the, the radiations that we talked about, okay? So, um, mutations in the oncogenes means that we are going to have uncontrolled cellular proliferation and tumor formation, okay? So this is to basically let you know that uh, oncogenes are those genes that when they are activated or when they, are, they have mutated, they can promote cellular growth and cell division and consequently leading to tumor formation. Okay, so uh, it is very important that these, the oncogenes are not actually inactivated because if they are activated, they result into uh, uncontrolled cellular growth and proliferation. So we have genes, uh, oncogenes such as the uh, HER2, uh, and then we have the KRAS and then EGFR. These are examples for oncogenes. And then the opposite, what you can say that uh, the, the, the cells that carry, the genes that carry out the opposite role of the oncogenes are the ones we call the tumor suppressor genes. Okay, tumor suppressor genes. That means that they, for them, they prevent cellular proliferation and inhibit tumor formation. Okay, so that means that so then they don't want cellular proliferation to really take place. But if the mutations occur in the tumor suppressor uh, genes, it means that their function is going to be disrupted and therefore a cellular proliferation will actually happen leading to cancer development. Okay, so we have a number of tumor suppressor genes.
begins. Uh, we have TP uh, F53. Okay, uh, the, we also talked about this in the uh, in the regulation of uh, the regulation of the cell cycle, uh, and then BRCA1 and then TTEN. These are examples for uh, tumor suppressor genes. So, for you to have uh, malignant cells, it does not happen out of the blue. We, there are a series of changes that happen in these cells. So we have the initiation stage, we have the promotion, and then we have the progression stage. When we talk about the initiation stage, we are basically referring to uh, uh, when you have genetic alteration. Okay? Uh, cellular genetic alterations that can happen because of the carcinogens, the chemicals that can cause cells to be cancerous. Which we said we have chemicals, uh, we have uh, radiations, viruses, like for example the human papilloma virus uh, that causes um, uh, uh, cervical cancer. Okay, uh, and then you also have or it is linked with cervical cancer and then we also have it is being reported that uh, helicobacter uh, pylori could also be associated with uh, stomach cancer which is basically a bacteria associated with uh, a cancer so um, you have these chemicals uh, damaging the genetic makeup of the cell so these changes or these alterations um, can happen whether in oncogenes or in tumor suppressor cells. Okay, and this eventually leading to abnormal cell growth. So the second one is that after the initiation, you will have now uh, the cells that um, have been in, uh, exposed to these agents now multiplying and expanding the expansion and proliferation of the initiated cells okay so we have substances that enhance the growth and survival of these uh, initiated cells and they are the ones that we call the promoters so they can include dietary factors hormones and also chronic inflammation they can make uh, the initiated cells to proliferate very fast and then uh, giving us a tumor and then progression uh, with the progression now the the, 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 the the malignant cells okay uh, are now actually starting to migrate to other places a process that we term as metastasis okay uh, through uh, the, the bloodstream or the lymphatic system. Okay, so this usually marks that the disease has actually uh, is actually advancing, it's progressing to other distant organs. So cancers can be classified in different ways, but in most importantly, cancer classification is very important um, uh, in terms of communicating what the cancer is all about. Um, as we shall know, we have different ways of classifying, that is the uh, classification that is based on the anatomic site, uh, histology, and then the extent of the disease. Um, now, when we look at this, it will, it will give us an understanding of why uh, this classification is very important, because it communicates issues to do with prognosis, treatment options, uh, and then also issues to do with evaluating treatment outcomes, whether um, whether you are having a cancer being contained or it is getting out of hand and it is not responding to treatment. Okay, so this classification gives us that idea uh, about cancers. So let's start with the, the anatomic classification. 
uh, with this we, the classification is based on uh, the classification is based on just a moment okay with this the classification is based on uh, the the anatomic part or the organ of tissue uh, the, 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 the organ of origin okay so with this um, with this classification you can actually allow us to have uh, a distinction between benign and malignant tumors which we have earlier on looked at so if we have uh, carcinoma carcinomas are usually malignant okay and the they, they arise from uh, from epithelial cells. So cells that line uh, the skin, the epithelial cells, and then cells that line the organs. Uh, it can be uh, cells that line the uh, the stomach, the liver, uh, the, and other organs. Okay, so those are the ones we call them. Carcinomas. So carcinomas are basically malignant tumors that arise from epithelial cells of organs, uh, uh, the lining of organs, uh, the skin, and then the glands. And then we have sarcoma. Uh, these are also malignant tumors that arise from mesenchymal tissues. So this is where we talk about the bones, uh, the muscles, and then connective tissue so osteosarcoma for example is the cancer of the bones okay um, no, uh, uh, that is a malignant tissue arising from mesenchymal tissues so uh, if you remember uh, the, 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 the jamal layers if you remember the jamal layers in angiogenesis uh, where we have the Ectoderm, endoderm, mesoderm. Okay, right. so where we, we, we mesenchymal tissues uh, give rise to the bones, muscles, and the connective tissue. So sarcoma are malignant tumors uh, for uh, organs that arise from the mesenchymal tissue during embry embryogenesis. And then we have lymphomas. These are basically cancers of the lymphatic system. And blood form organs. And then leukemia, cancers of the blood, uh, especially the white blood cells. Blastomas, these are basically malignant tumors arising from immature embryogenic or uh, fetal tissues. Okay, for example, retinoblastoma that affects the eye common cancer among these children. So we move to the second classification, um, which is histologic classification. When we talk about histological classification, we are basically referring to uh, how cells appear and their level of differentiation. Okay? So uh, they can be graded from grade, uh, from, from grade 1 grade 4 based on how closely they resemble the cells of the normal tissue okay so um, grade 4 tumors are poorly differentiated and have a worse uh, prognosis than well differentiated uh, grade 1 tumors okay so that means that uh, if you don't have the cells being well differentiated, then you're going to have problems in treating it. Uh, that's a, the, the, the meaning there. So grade one, uh, these cells display slightly different from the normal, uh, and they, they exhibit some mild dysplasia. And then uh, they are actually well differentiated, and they resemble the tissue of origin. And then stage two, uh, the cells have more abnormalities with the uh, moderate dysplasia. 
okay and they are more towards the differentiated okay uh, and they exhibit more pronounced deviations from the normal tissue and then would be three uh, these ones are actually uh, highly abnormal demonstrating high or severe dysplasia poorly differentiated and display significant deviation from the normal structure the normal tissue structure and then the last one which are basically uh, these cells uh, appear immature okay uh, that means they are not really differentiated they don't resemble the organ uh, of origin so they are difficult to actually identify and then the last type of uh, classification is the extent of disease classification no actually the second last i think uh, which is the uh, last uh, the, the the one where we have clinical staging from from stage one to stage four i mean to, from stage zero to stage four okay so stage one is the cancer in situ and then stage two uh, the the tumor limited to the organ of origin and then you have uh, the, 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 the tumor limited which is having which is spreading to a nearby nearby uh, areas okay and then stage three the, the, we are having the, the, the tumor moving to regional points and whereas anchor is so um, locally where it, it, it started from and then stage four is when you have the metastasis. Okay, so let's really go deep into understanding what um, cancer in situ means, uh, so that we have a very good uh, understanding of that concept. Um, so bef bef before the cells actually become extremely uh, cancerous we have the situation where they are precancerous okay uh, they are abnormal okay they are they, they are actually abnormal cells okay uh, and they have not started invading the nearby tissues or even spreading to other areas so that is what we call uh, cancer in cancer in situ okay the cells have not really started to see the way uh, to these type of guts. Okay, they are still there in the part where they are originating from. So they are confined in one place. Okay, so the cells, if you examine, they display uh, malignant characteristics but have not yet developed the ability to spread to these type of guts. Okay. Uh, Diagnosis of cell in tissue um, of cancer in situ is crucial as it indicates a high likelihood of developing invasive uh, cancer if it is left un untreated. Okay, so uh, this, this often in clinical practice can be an accidental finding. Okay, so uh, yeah, yeah. Treatment of such a situation is very key because it can actually improve prognosis. Okay, so this is where also screening becomes key. Remember, we talked about screening uh, for people who are at high risk and perhaps high high risk because of genetic predisposition. Uh, so. Um, screening also plays an important role in this case where the, the cancer has not really uh, started to to cause certain signs and symptoms. Okay, uh, so uh, biopsies can be can be done to to really uh, detect this, this 
these cursors. Mm, and then we have diagnostic tools that can be done, I mean tests that can be done, such as maybe uh, mammographs, uh, chronoscopy, uh, pap smear, skin biopsy. These are some of the diagnostic uh, uh, imaging tests that can actually uh, diagnostic tools that include imaging tests that can be done uh, to, uh, to detect or even grade uh, or even stage different uh, cancers. Okay, um, so with biopsy it's basically about getting a sample of the tissue and then see uh, the presence of abnormal cells. So, if you detect cancers in situ, cancer in situ, uh, it gives you um, it gives you a chance to be able to treat it early and reduce the risk of it progressing to other uh, to other part of of, of um, it gives a chance to reduce the risk of progression to invasive cancer. So the treatment options, just like for all cancers, um, include uh, either surgery, or radiotherapy, chemotherapy, or targeted therapy, depending on the, 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 the type and location of the cancer. But it's also very important to even uh, have um, proper follow-up, such that the, the, if, 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 if it is being treated, and then it does not come back again. So that monitoring is also very, uh, very key. Uh, like I said, early detection gives you an uh, upper hand in treating, and therefore you are most likely going to have uh, a good prognosis with cancers and C2. So the last type of classification that we're going to look at is the one we call the TNM classification system. Um, this gives information about the tumor size, uh, the extent of uh, nodal involvement and metastasis. Therefore, it also aids in determining the cancer stage. Okay, the T basically looks at the tumor size and invasiveness. Okay. Uh, so we look at the, the extent, the size of the tumor and the extent uh, of the primary tumor. When we say it is T4, it means there is no evidence of primary tumor. Uh, the grading of T1 to T4 it means uh, it, it indicates the, the increasing size and the, the local extent of the tumor. The higher the number, means the more extent uh, the cancer is actually invasive. Okay? And then the N looks at the number of uh, uh, regional lymph nodes involved. Okay? Uh, the, the, the cancers have spread to what regional lymph nodes? Okay? Uh, so N0 refers to no lymph node involvement. And then N1 to N3 indicates the increasing number or extent of lymph nodes involved. Okay, and the more you have more lymph nodes involved, it means the more aggressive or the more extensive the cancer is. And then the M this uh, reflects the distant metastasis, which is basically the cancer that has spread to other parts. Um, with MO meaning that no evidence of distant metastasis, and then uh, M, uh, M1 representing presence of distant metastasis, indicating that the cancer has spread to other parts. Uh, so often uh, you may not use the TNM uh, classification system uh, alone. Okay, you may use uh, other classification systems also in combination okay so that is basically what 
is being referred to here. Um, uh, it has limitations. One, that your course, not all classes, will actually progress in the same way. So it may not really apply to certain cancers. And then um, certain cancers, yes, such as leukemia, will not really fit to be described using the TNM classification system. Um, staging. Uh, the staging system can actually keep changing based on the diagnostic techniques that we have. So uh, it may not be something that you can rely on over and over uh, because of advancement in diagnostic systems that can involve and change the understanding of um, cancer biology. Um, however, we can use it in clinical practice because it, it can give us information on the extent to which the cancer has metastasized, um, whether the treatment out the treatment is actually the, the patient is responding to treatment, or whether the cancer is actually responding to the treatment, and the, um, it it communicates it facilitates communication between uh, health workers. When you write M one, it communicates something another health worker who can be reading the patient's file. Uh, the extent of also the metastasis and the grading, the staging, things like that, can also give us information on what treatment modality can actually be used. But of course, the cancer in the patient will not, may not remain at the same uh, stage. So that means that the classification will keep on changing over time as the patient is being treated. So uh, that's why it requires regular updating. Okay, uh, so cancers uh, play, they, they bring uh, a lot of burden to the public health system or the health system. So it is very important that cancers are actually, uh, are actually prevented. So prevention is very important and the um, apart from prevention, early, early detection also becomes very important. Why? Early thing is very important. Um, early detection means that you increase the chances of uh, surviving. Okay? Uh, so prognosis is much more better. That's one. But of course, the resources that you use to treat. The treatment of cancer is actually very expensive. So that means the early you detect it and treat it early enough, it means that you are actually saving resources. So that is the other part. Um, and you suffering uh, the economic impact, the quality of life, and all those things, means that it is very important to have a lot of efforts in preventing cancers. So how do you prevent cancer? Uh, cease from smoking, and that means that actually reverse the other risk factors that we talked about. Uh, uh, sm stop smoking, uh, eat a good diet, uh, rich in vegetables, avoid the processed foods, red meat and things like that, exercise regularly, uh, go for screening, it's about lifestyle now, go for screening, avoid exposures to, to carcinogens, those who work with these the x-rays, nuclear uh, CT scans and whatever, you need to make sure that you protect yourself uh, from these exposures, take those measures. Um, so early detection can be done through screening and uh, for breast cancer specifically, um, self-breast examination becomes very key and the uh, health workers play an important role in in helping uh, patients know how to do uh, self-breast examination. And pap smears for cervical cancer is also very, uh, very important. Okay, we also have screening for other, um, other cancers. Um, and very many uh, procedures or interventions can be done to actually uh, prevent the cancer from progressing if it is detected early. So 
diagnosis, we earlier on said that we, we have a number of uh, diagnostic and the uh, imaging uh, techniques that can be done to detect the cancer. We talked about uh, uh, biopsies, we talked about uh, uh, CT scans, we can talk about uh, Uh, biopsies, CT scans, we can talk about uh, detection of biomarkers, it's also very, very important in detecting uh, certain cancers. Okay? So, treatment modalities, different cancers can be treated using different uh, modalities or a combination of the different modalities. You can have surgery that is supplemented by chemotherapy or you can have chemotherapy uh, combined with radiotherapy things like that so let's look at what this actually means surgery is when we remove the, the affected part okay the removal of the cancerous tumors and the surrounding tissues okay um, it is appropriate for as a first line treatment for solid tumors those that are uh, that are localized okay and they, they are in places where you can really operate okay uh, so you have different types of surgeries that can be conducted curative is basically if you remove the tumor it's likely that uh, the person is going to cure from the cancer palliative is where you basically uh, the, the person you know the cancer um, is terminal is terminal is going to result into end of life but you don't want a person to die with the, uh, these a uh, uh, this tumor that is going to make their life extremely very bad okay basically improving the quality of life uh, they, you cut out the surgery to relieve the pain but it will not uh, heal, okay, the person is at terminal stage. And then the bulking surgery is basically about partial removal of a tumor to reduce its size and alleviate symptoms and combine it with other chemo, uh, with other treatments like chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And then we have radiation where High energy beam is used to destroy cancerous cells and inhibit their growth. Okay, so radiations uh, can be internal or external. The radiations basically damage the DNA of the cancerous cells and preventing them from dividing and applying further. And then we have chemotherapy. This is when we are used, the, the drugs are used to basically kill the cancerous drugs. They can be administered orally or intravenously. Um, so chemotherapy is often used as a systematic treatment for, to reach cancerous cells. Okay, so when you take them intravenously or even uh, through, uh, through the mouth that is orally, it results into systematic distribution and therefore they will go to the cancerous cells. And then targeted therapy. This is where the, the drugs the, 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 it, it, where the drugs interfere with specific molecules that are involved in cell growth and I mean cancer growth and progression. Okay? So that means that he, for them they these, these drugs target the, the, the cancerous cells and be able to destroy them but not attack the ones that are actually known. And then the last one, uh, the last treatment modality which is uh, immunotherapy, um, is about enhancing the immune, the immune system so that it can fight the cancerous cells. Remember, we said that the immune system can be able to detect abnormal cancerous cells and be able to eliminate them, kill.
kill the microbe. So if you boost the immune system, it will be able to uh, enhance the body's ability to remove, um, detect, and remove, even kill cells that are cancerous. Thank you for listening.